welcome everyone. Thank you uh, for showing up. I, I wasn't exactly sure how many people would be here, but from what I hear, this is like record breaking. So <laughs> that's exciting. Um, uh, as um, as Katie mentioned, my name is Jacob Seabach. I am an anthropology major um, here, and in North America, whenever you are an anthropology major, you focus in one of uh, four fields. You're either going to be looking at culture, biology, um, archaeology, or linguistics, and it's actually the, the final one that I'm looking at, and I am a linguistics minor. Um, it was in pursuit of that minor that I actually met Dr. Hildebrandt, I think it was last semester, so spring 2017, um, in her class, uh, Language, Endangerment, and Death. So throughout that class, I got to kind of get a background in what endangered languages actually are, um, got to talk with Dr. Hildebrandt, get to know what sort of work she's doing in that field, what sort of work is happening in Nepal. And um, also, in that class, I'll go ahead and plug it, it's kind of interesting, instead of doing a research paper, uh, we designed a research website. It was designed on the Omeka platform, which I think some of you have heard about before. I think we've done a presentation about this before. Um, and we'll talk about it a little bit as it comes into play here. On top of that, it may have helped me get this job, so I did not do it. Um, so today we're going to be talking about some earthquakes that happened in Nepal in 2015, um, talking about how those apply to language endangerment, and then we're going to talk about what SIUE is doing in the IRIS Center um, to design archives and exhibits to house some of the data collected there. So um, basically, we're going to go over a little bit of language endangerment and death. Um, I want to give people a background in that if you're not quite sure what that is. Uh, we'll talk about the earthquakes. We'll talk about the National Science Foundation RAPID program and that how, how that works here. Then we'll talk about how we've designed and built the archive, where it's at now, and where it's headed in the future. All right, so language endangerment and death. Um, it's, it's a very complex sort of issue. And I'm going to give you basically just some, some cursory background information. There's, there's a lot to go through. But essentially what it is, is language is inextricably tied to human beings. Um, humans are mortal. Human groups can disband. And with that, um, those languages can disband as well. Some rather striking statistics are surrounding uh, languages today. Um, it's really hard to, to calculate how many languages are in the world. It really depends on how you define a language. But Generally speaking, it's somewhere between five and 7,000, um, which is a pretty big range, but that's the closest we can get to agreeing. Um, of those, between 2,500 and 3,000 are considered endangered, considered in a place where they may end up no longer existing in the near future. Um, some incredibly uh, devastating, but drastic estimates would say that by the end of the century, we might see 90% of languages go away. So, there's a lot of scholarship surrounding this topic of language endangerment. It's, um, especially in the, the last few decades, we're trying to find a uh, standardized typology of what endangerment actually is. It's not as if a language is just endangered or it's not. It's, it's sort of a continuum. And the way that we figure out how endangered a language actually is, um, is by asking a few different questions. Those uh, questions talk about how closely identified with a culture or a cultural identity that language is linked. Um, some of it has to do with whether or not a language has a literature or an alphabet. And some of it, most of it actually has to do with how quickly a um, or to, to what degree an older generation is transmitting that language to younger generations. If you think about it, if your grandparents uh, speak a language that is rather traditional for their people, but the language being spoken around you in, in school, in your work, 
is not that language, how likely are you to be speaking that? So, very quickly, throughout one or two generations even, we can actually see languages start to disappear as generations that spoke them uh, start to uh, pass away. So some of the, the biggest causes of language endangerment would be the functionality. How functional is the language you're speaking? And, and that comes back into um, your social groups, the people that you work with, how likely it is that you can trade with the person with that language, and um, whether or not you're going to be able to get advanced degrees that give you opportunities for monetary gain with that language. Um, proximity to glo globally powerful languages is also something that is very important to look at in language endangerment. Um, one of the languages that I look at in my personal research is the language Nahuatl. It was the history, uh, historic language of the Aztec, and it's still spoken by quite a few people in central Mexico, right around Mexico City. But the proximity of that language to this globally powerful language, Spanish, we're starting to see that Nahuatl could soon be in an endangered status. Basically, Nahuatl's not spoken in the schools. It's not the language of business. And you've got this huge urban hub where you're basically forced to speak Spanish if you want to get around. That's a huge variable in a uh, language becoming endangered. Then, this, this one, the one about human mortality and linguistic mortality being linked. As we start to see generations get older, they pass away, we no longer see those languages. Why does it matter? It matters because well, there, there are really two, two schools. You know, some would say that the fewer languages we have in the world, the more communication is facilitated. If I don't have to know your language, if I don't have to know Yoruba, or something like that, and we can all just get along with English, wouldn't it be easier to trade throughout the world? Well, possibly, but there are a lot of problems with that, you know. Which language is that global language going to be? It's a big one. If, if I told you it was going to be Yoruba, for instance, how would you feel about doing away with English? <laughs> there are a lot of emotions that go into play there. Um, but, but really, you know, we're, we're in the humanities. I think that we can all say that we appreciate and value the diversity that exists in the world. We, we have these languages that have within them knowledge and ways of knowing, okay? And if we start to see that diversity lessen, we start to not have the fullest human experience that we can have. We start to not know as much as we possibly could. Furthermore, whenever we look at issues such as language acquisition or just the cognitive processes of the brain, we talk about it as a black box problem. We say we can see the input and we can see the output. I've got a one-year-old son who's you know, starting to babble right now, and I know that his input is from me, his mom, and Dory, and Nemo, and I know that what is coming out is, you know, going to go through a certain pattern. What I don't know is what's happening inside. Whenever we look at various languages and their diversity, we start to learn things about the ways that people organize information in the way that they use it to communicate. So that's why we would call it important. And then finally, what can we do about it? So, as we talked about it, language endangerment really exists on a continuum. It might be extremely endangered. In that case, we would call it moribund. We would say it's really beyond the point of saving. We want to salvage as much of that as possible. So, linguistic documentarians will go into these places, and they'll talk with speakers of these languages, and record them, and just say, hey, tell me a story. Tell me your creation stories. Tell me what is important in your culture. Tell me recipes. They use all kinds of different things to get people to just speak in common language. Written language and spoken language. Very different things. So the closer we can get people to the natural environment of the language, the more we can document it in its natural place. That's what we do for languages that we say we can't really save. Okay? But with uh, languages that are not so far on the endangerment scale, we try and do things like revitalization processes. 
And that might look like something as simple as getting together, getting a community together once a month for a game night. But on that game night, you're not allowed to do anything but speak in that traditional language. All of a sudden, you, you start to feel an identity with that language. You start to feel as though that language isn't just extra information in your brain that will never do you any good. It's actually something that is fun. It's, it helps you to communicate. It's something special about you and about your people. Those types of revitalization processes are something that you can do with those languages. All right, so how does language endangerment apply to Nepal? Let's get there. I've been given a directive to uh, tell you that Nepal is not another way to pronounce Naples. Um, apparently, as, as learned as you may be, that is important to tell you. Um, it's actually just north of the Indian subcontinent, just south of the Tibetan plateau. So there are a lot of things that can create linguistic diversity. You can start with one language and then just disband over vast geographic areas to the point that you're so far away, there's no diffusion between you. So the languages start to become different. So what we saw with Latin and the Romance languages. So we have Spanish and Italian. Then there are other reasons. There are topographic boundaries. These mountains are huge. Okay, So if you have a village in a mountain valley without an easy pass to get to another village, that doesn't really facilitate trade between those villages. You then do not have that cultural diffusion. You don't have that linguistic diffusion. And so you start to see heterogeneity instead of one homogenous group. How does that apply here? Well, in 2015, there were these two massive earthquakes, less than a month apart, in total taking out more than 9,000 individuals. With these small villages and so many people passing away at the same time, large portions of those populations were lost. Large portions of these speaking populations were lost. What that means is that a speaking population has then dwindled down in an instant to very few speakers, making these languages, and there are around 15 just in the region that Dr. Hildebrand is looking, that have lost large pop, uh, portions of the population. That's a huge impact on whether or not that language is going to be sustainable. Not only that, but there are external factors to think about. We can think about if I can no longer get my milk from the person down the way because they're no longer around, do I start to branch out to other places to get the things that I need? If I no longer have work because my workplace has been destroyed, do I leave and go to more toward the capital here at Kathmandu and look for job opportunities where they're not speaking my language? I need to either speak Nepali or English to be able to get around there. These are those variables that we talked about before and the proximity to that global superpower is going to be even more prevalent. So, the earthquakes happened in 2015, and Dr. Hildebrandt uh, applies for something called a rapid grant. Um, and the National Science Foundation obviously gives out a lot of money for scholarship in the US, and they have something called the rapid program for situations where time is at a premium. Dr. Hildebrandt wanted to record responses to these earthquakes. He wanted to see, you know, what are people talking about with them? Um, what happened to their general homes, the, the areas that they lived? And what were some governmental and non-governmental responses to um, the, the earthquakes? What were the relief efforts like? She tells me that it took a little bit less than a month, I think, to, to get some um, funding for this, and then quickly went over to Nepal, um, assembled kind of an ad hoc team of linguists uh, together with some other scholars in the area, and um, their goal was to go around and basically record people telling their stories. They uh, trained groups of, of uh, people who spoke the local languages and um, train them in some survey methods, train them on how to use cameras, how to use audio recording equipment, things of that nature, and, um, and, and sent them out on their way. They were uh, 
instructed to do some structured survey questions, as well as some conversational prompts. So um, with the survey questions, we were looking to get sort of a control group, right? If we ask the same questions to everyone, then we can kind of look at patterns throughout that, correlations and contrasts. With the conversational prompts, we were basically saying, what was it like? What happened? Where were you whenever the earthquake happened? Was your family nearby? Did you know where they were? What did it sound like? What was your first inclination that an earthquake was happening? Did you know what it was? And finally, what sorts of relief efforts came your way? What we saw actually quite a bit was that Kathmandu saw the majority of the relief effort funding. You know, they, they had to uh, repair their infrastructure, roads, hotels, things like that. You don't have those things, you don't have any income, and that's a big problem for a city. So a lot of these outlying localities didn't see much um, response in that way. <coughs> Why was this important uh, from a linguistic standpoint? Again, stories are very different than written language. Stories are the natural environment that a speaker speaks. You get sentence fragments in stories. You get sounds and hand gestures and things like that in stories. You don't get that in written language. So already, just on a, a superficial glance at this data, we're finding things about um, onomatopoetics. So in our language, we use onomatopoeia to create words like boom, right? I say boom. The word itself sounds like what it's describing. We didn't know anything about those in these types of languages. So as we're getting descriptions of the earthquakes, we also get rumbling sounds and things like that. Those are very interesting to see what humans kind of create to make these sounds. So how does all of this apply to IRIS? How does this apply to the digital humanities here? Okay, so 2015, we got all the data. 2016, uh, Dr. Hildebrandt writes another grant proposal. This time, it says, you know, we, we didn't have the time to really know what we were going to do with all of this data whenever uh, we originally proposed this project. But now we've had time to glance over it, had time to think about it, and here's a proposal for what we would like to do with it. Give us more money. <laughs> so. The idea was that we would develop a small institution, a SIUE, our home base, would create an archive and an exhibit. We're going to uh, not put all of this data in an external um, location at a big institution that has um, sources and contributions from all over the world. What if we did this thing on a local scale? What sort of benefits would we see? So it wasn't just a proposal to create the archive and house it here. It was a proposal to document the process of creating that archive. Because if we can see benefits that a small institution has in creating an archive, then perhaps it behooves all of us to look at what we're doing with our data. On a broad scale, uh, for instance, at the University of Virginia, um, Dr. Hildebrandt has a lot of her data um, on an archive called Shanty. That archive also has information from all over the world. Um, you can imagine that if they're receiving contributions from Southern Illinois, that they're also receiving contributions from very far away in Virginia. Now, you can create some standards. You can try and create a baseline for how you're putting all of that data in. But at some point, it just becomes a very difficult process to kind of hone or specialize. That's the benefit of a small university. Not only with our digital humanities minor do we now have an outlet for internships for our students to get real, uh, real world contact with the work that you might be doing later on, but we also have the ability to specialize and hone in on exactly what we want to do with this data. So there was very specific wording surrounding the archive and the exhibit. Um, so we'll just look at that. Uh, the archive is a digital repository of collections of organized language data and related information connected to the data gathered during the fieldwork phase of the project. This is 
everything. This is video recordings, audio recordings, transcripts of those things. We've got some, I believe, alphabets. We've got um, not only that, but I think that this very talk, this presentation is going to go up there. It's just as important for us to document the process of creating the archive as it is to populate the archive with the data itself. Then we move on to the exhibit. The exhibit is slightly different. It's smaller than the archive. It's curated. We're going to take specific stories from the archive itself and make this sort of public facing. We don't want our archive to be something that only a linguist can read. We don't want uh, somebody to get to the archive and have to spend hours really picking through every piece to figure out what they're looking for. We wanted this to be pretty. You know, we wanted this to be something that the average Joe could come up and, and look at it and say, I want to know what's going on here. So we're going to take certain pieces from each of the language families uh, and, and bring um, stories from each of those to the forefront to really expose what's going on in Nepal um, and what's going on with language endangerment in general. Uh, it's something that affects all of us, even if we don't know it. So, the next step then was to build those things. Uh, Dr. Hildebrandt hired an interdisciplinary team um, composed of Tanner Birch Beckley and myself. I really did have hair at one time, it wasn't that long ago. Um, and he is from a computer science background, and I am from the anthropology background. I, I honestly couldn't have ask for a better team member who really can do everything that I can't do and I have some knowledge that he doesn't have but he's, he's really very on top of it. Um, I think we complement each other well in this process. Our first step um, to create this archive was to look at existing archives. We wanted to see what other larger archives um, are doing and kind of just look at the um, the items that they had there and figure out what we liked about them, figure out what we didn't like about them, figure out what was absolutely necessary, which portions might be luxury. After that, we composed a uh, product requirements document. Um, this is something I had some background in in my previous career. Um, and, and essentially what we were doing was thinking through every single step that a user might see on the website. If they click this button, what happens? If this page doesn't have anything on it, what does the website do? You have to think through every single step with the website, and, um, and that's what we tried to do. I think this document ended up being something like 12 or 15 pages long. Um, after that, after we had our requirements, we basically looked at the platforms that were capable of facilitating those requirements. Um, what we ended up coming up with was a combination, a synthesis of Omeka and WordPress. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, after that, we composed the uh, site architecture. It was basically a framework, um, kind of empty shells, but the hierarchy is all there. All there. We've got the pages in place. They just happen to be empty at the moment. The last step will be to populate the archive side of things and then to um, pull that information over into our website architecture. So we chose uh, WordPress and Omeka, as I mentioned. Really, whenever we looked at it, these were the options that we had. IT infrastructure here at the university already had the ability to uh, host sites on these two platforms. Um, and we liked the interplay between the two for this reason. Omeka is an incredible archiving tool. It already has Dublin Core metadata standard um, in it, which means that as far as um, archiving purposes, as far as exhibit building purposes, all of the information from the person who took a picture to the location of the picture to the subject of the picture, you can have all of that stuff just in the metadata of the item. That's really important when building an archive to have as much information as possible. WordPress, I'll be honest, we used it because it's aesthetically pleasing. It's, um, it's pretty. It draws the user in. It is easy to use. It's intuitive. Okay? And that was really important for us because remember, we didn't want to build an archive just for linguists. 
We wanted to build an archive and an exhibit that draws somebody in who might not know anything about these topics. We wanted it to be extremely user friendly so that nobody's getting lost and know exactly what they're doing. So, the current state, what we've done so far, where we're at now. Um, we're still trying to collect data from all of the people that were working in Nepal at the time. As I mentioned, uh, Dr. Hildebrandt wasn't going at this alone. She was working with other scholars in various areas of Nepal that um, were also affected by the earthquakes. And then also with the teams that they hired to go out and do the field work. So we've started receiving some of the information, but it's kind of a slow process, collating all of that data, getting it in one place. Um, we're then uh, also working to basically tweak Omeka so that we can integrate it seamlessly with WordPress. Um, we are then also populating Omeka right now with all of the archival information. We've got all the items, the pictures, the videos, the recordings, but we have yet to actually upload those to the archive and put all of the metadata information in. I'm going to um, show you the site here for a second. Well, I thought it was. Maybe it's not going to work as well as I thought it would. Basically, what we have on the site uh, is this is the home page. As you can see at the top, We've got these top level um, tiers, and then we've got some drop downs on them. So our project is going to have an about page. It's going to give all of the background, kind of talk about um, the things that I've talked about here. Why this project exists, what it's going to do, uh, things of that nature, as well as have team member bios. Then we're also going to have uh, language profiles for each of the languages that we're treating in this project. Um, we'll talk a little bit about them, about how they were specifically affected by the quakes, and we'll talk about their endangerment level and things of that nature. Then we'll have links to the exhibit and the archive as well. Finally, whenever we do all of those things, um, we're looking to uh, submit a paper to this journal of linguistic documentation and conservation. It's out of Hawaii. Dr. Hildebrand's done quite a bit of work with them um, previously. And again, there are several directives, uh, several objectives to this project. It is to house all of the data that was collected. It is to display it in a way that is interesting and approachable for people who have no linguistic knowledge. It is to create an archive that is comprehensive, has everything you could possibly imagine, uh, including publications surrounding the research done there to uh, presentations like this one. And not only that, but we're documenting every step of the process along the way so that other institutions can take what we've done and possibly replicate it. Um, we're, we're not looking to hold all of this to ourselves. If, if there are benefits to be had, we want to share them. So. That's the goal. We'll be starting work on that paper um, over Christmas break, maybe January, uh, with, with hopes of submitting that uh, before the end of the spring semester. I think that's about it. Are there any questions? <laughs>